started on sort of a pilot scale this summer, and it's uh, one of the species that's sort of precipitously gone downward, and just trying to figure out what's going on, where, is it habitat, is it other things, a lot of those types of birds, the, um, the aerial insectivores, the, seems to be a group of species that has been in the most decline um, in the northeast, and so there's lots of work now trying to figure out how do we even go about figuring the questions and the answers to that. Um, and so that's definitely going to be probably one of the projects over the next several years and it'll probably become a fairly big citizen science project because it's one of those that people can get out there. There's birds that are relatively easy to identify um, compared to all your, your sparrows and um, a few of the warblers and things like that. Which is one reason why loons is, is so much fun because I get to involve people who don't know anything about any wildlife whatsoever, but they know loons, and yeah. it's and you can do it, and it's anyone can do it. Um, so it's been a, a really huge sort of citizen science project. I'm probably coordinating close to 300 people who are on my list actively. I have about 700 on my list that are, are sort of contacts, and maybe enough, maybe a, only 40 or 50 of those are out there all the time, reporting in, doing doing everything, so that I never have to go to those lakes. We have another 50 or 60 who are contacts on those lakes. They report in to me once in a while. I often shoot them a phone call or an email, and they almost always know what's going on. I have another 100 people who help just on the annual count day called Loon Watch. It's third Saturday of July. And then I have another 100 people who contact me over, over the period of time here and there. And they're sort of a late contact, but you know, very, very low key. So it's kind of neat that you could be out there half an hour one summer, and that's it. Or you could be out there half an hour every day and contributing to this project in many ways. Uh, it's, I guess, to give a little bit of history, um, it, it started back in 1977, actually, a few initial surveys um, through VINs, and the reason they, they started looking around was New Hampshire had just done about a four-year, three or four-year study, they've been going or monitoring, and they realized there was about a 50% decline from the early part of the century. They had much better historical records than we did here in Vermont. So they started going around a lot of lakes, and they were discovering a lot of empty lakes, as far as loons go. And so they widened that out, did a few more you know, repeated surveys, because that's pretty important to be able to do that, loons were moving around and all that. Um, so in 78 onward, it's been going pretty full-fledged, hitting a good chunk of the lakes in Vermont. There were about 20 pairs, early, low 20s, um, with 15 to 20 nesting in the late 70s and the early 80s, and then for some reason there was a a drop down to 12 pairs with only seven nesting back in 1983. At that time though there was a big oil spill, or not an oil spill, sorry, um, a, uh, a toxic algae bloom down in Florida, um, red tide, I think, um, and there were about five or six hundred loons found dead. Um, this is back in, eight, yeah, 83, the winter before 83, 82, 83. And so we thought, boy, there's, is that the culprit? Well, little did we know, our 99% of our birds are off the New England coast. Those weren't our birds. 
Those were Midwestern birds. So that's not why the population dropped down to seven nesting pairs that year. Um, we don't really know the, I mean, it wouldn't take much. You know, there could be one little accident, it could be a tough winter. Um, winter mortality is probably the biggest source of adult mortality. You know, think about living off Cape Cod through January, February, going through a molt, losing all your feathers, being flightless, having to fish, and it's 25 degrees and raining and 30 mile an hour winds, and I mean, that's, that's a tough life. So uh, uh, that's probably where most of that's happening. And um, so anyway, the population slowly came back um, up to 20 pairs again by the late 80s, early 90s. Um, we got up, actually, no, no, sorry got up to about 15 pairs nesting, 20-some pairs territorial by the mid-90s. So we're talking a 10-year period, about one new pair a year. Um, and I'd love to take credit for this, but um, since then, we've gone from about 27, 28 pairs when I started, to this year we had 84 nesting attempts. Um, and over 100 pairs statewide. And I say 100 pairs versus nesting pairs. Nesting is the actual ones who are nesting. There's usually about 20% of the population of pairs don't nest in a given year. Sometimes it's 10%, sometimes it's 30%. They just, for whatever reason, aren't nesting. And we can get into that, because there's a, a lot of neat stuff about territorial interactions and what's going on with that, of why they don't nest. So it's been an incredible comeback story. In 87, they were put on the endangered species list after the crash. In 2005, they were removed from the endangered species list, because we met some target goals that were kind of darts on the bulletin board. We didn't know real science behind it except that 40 pairs sounded good compared to 10 pairs. Um, and that was, the goal was 30 pairs to delist from endangered, 40 pairs for threatened. Over a five year period with disjunct population, with at least a certain percent, I think five or six in southern Vermont, southern, southern half of Vermont. We're now up to 15 pairs in the southern half of Vermont that are nesting, which is to me actually the most, I'm one of the most exciting because Prior to 1995, 96, there was one pair in the southern half. Um, that was down in Somerset Reservoir. For some reason, there's been a pair there um, just kind of hanging. Um, and uh, although it's been, it's probably different birds. Um, uh, destroy the myth right now, loons don't mate for life. Uh, there's, there's constant pressure by non-breeders going after existing territories. And they're always coming in. We call, I call them intruder loons. In all the reports that I, I got from all my predecessors, it was extraterritorial loons. But it's like, what does that mean? <laughs> so intruder just was like, to the point. It's, it's really what they are. They're coming in, they're checking out the pair, doing their thing. Um, most of the time, it's just sort of an interaction of birds swimming around. Um, I know you, you know me. OK, I'm leaving. Um, but once in a while, that intruder's coming in with a little more zest. And it could be a female, it could be a male. and. Um, it's actually sort of checking out the territory. Is it a good territory? Do you have a good mate? And it could be the male checking out the other male and female, or it could be a female checking out the pair as well. So it's, it's, it's just really fascinating how that happens. There's a guy in Wisconsin who's been following banded birds now for 20-some years and just getting some answers now. Um, it's taken that long of following banded birds to really figure out what are they saying to each other, who's moving where, um, and part of it is assessing the lake, part of it's assessing the pair, part of it's getting familiar with everything, so that if one of them <coughs> dies or doesn't return, bingo, they're, they're in there, because they know it, they know the other bird, the bird accepts them quicker. But it could come down to actually a fight, and we'll have wing rowing, chases around the water, you'll have yodeling going on at each other. We'll have birds that um, will penguin dance together and actually just chase for hours, and sometimes days, that they'll just keep going at each other, and it's exhausting. And we'll often get a report of a bird, we have a beach loon, it's a sick loon, it's an injured loon. Well, it may just be recovering from fights and chases. Um, and hopefully it can skedaddle out of there before anything happens after that. Males with testosterone, I suppose, are more aggressive than the females. So some of the more of those fights end up in death. Um, we actually had probably two birds killed by other loons this summer. Um, so, and we, because we saw the, we, people saw the chases and the fighting, and that's actually one of the best benefits of having all these volunteers out there is they see what's going on. They see the eagle. They see the boaters. They see whatever you know, might be happening. Ends up, though, these were, birds were compromised. Um, they were already dying of lead or fishing gear. Um, we ended up having five mortalities this summer. Um, three of them have been confirmed to be lead, but we were waiting full necropsies to really figure out what the source is. Uh, and that, we sent all the birds to Tufts University. And they 
a guy named Mark Pokris, absolutely amazing guy. If you ever have a chance to hear him talk, he's just so much fun um, talking about death. So, <laughs> if you can believe it, he really does shine a light on it in a, in a different way. So, uh, and so it's been a, a lot of fun working with that group and all of that. Um, so that's kind of a quick gist of the project, where it's been. We do a lot of management. I can talk a little bit about that. Um, probably the most exciting stuff I do are the rescues. And I'll, I'll definitely try to take five, ten minutes and tell you a few rescue stories. But I also want to just ex um, encourage people to jump in with questions. Things that you've wanted to know. Um, and, uh, yeah. I have a question. The, the, we were always under the impression that loons like very quiet lakes and we're not supposed to disturb them. And when I go to Joe's Pond in Danville, there's <laughs> motorboats and water skiers and idiots, and the loons are still there. So is that a myth, or do loons, are they able to tolerate a lot of noise? And they can habituate. And uh, that's the simple answer. The, going back to the 60s and 70s, when we were down low numbers, we tended to see the loons on these quieter lakes. That was probably first choice for territory, if it had a good marsh, if it had a good island. Um, that's really what's going to make a nesting lake or not a nesting lake. Um, and these other lakes that, uh, you know, I think of Seymour and Caspian and Willoughby and Crystal, great big lakes, no nesting. People are like, why? What's going on? There's no habitat. And we probably, in some cases, we really don't want to encourage that habitat anymore. Um, partly because of people. There's, there, those lakes are very busy and crowded, and it's just tough to manage loon space and, and, nesting, er, and, and people space. Um, but part of it is also, they were pro probably didn't have nesting on those lakes 300, 400 years ago. Um, so we, should, we, should we be encouraging nesting on lakes that may not have had it before? So we're really trying to let loons make the first move before we jump in with management. Now, getting back to Joe's Pond and, and the busyness, yeah, they can tolerate a heck of a lot. They learn what's a threat, what's not a threat. Um, they can, the, the biggest probably, um, I guess, vulnerability that we've been able to change is, is nesting sites, where we work with the landowner. How do you use your beach next to that loon site? How do you use your island where loons are nesting? Do you have a camp on it? Do you just visit it? Do you picnic there? Um, can we close it down for a month with some signs? Uh, those are things, so I, for new nesting pairs, I spent a lot of time going to town clerks and finding phone numbers. And um, so I'm really more of a, a manager and an educator than I am a biologist in some regards, at least the, what I actually do. So working that way has really made a big difference on these ponds. So when they first nested on Joe's Pond, we had some people who were chimed in to loons. They were contacting me right away. We were out there with some signs. It was on, down a boat channel, but it was also up in the north end, a little quieter than the rest of the lake. We gave them a quiet spot on a very busy lake. Get the, once they hatch, they leave the nest site. They're, they're out of there within hours. If there's two chicks, they're out of there within 36 to 48 hours. Um, and they're done with that nest site. We've had a few cases where we've seen loons back on a, on a nest site with the chicks overnight. But that's only been documented, I think I've heard twice in, in some years. Um, so they're out there swimming around. They usually stay in the quieter bays. And on the busy lakes, I think they must learn, for the most part, not all of them, to, to stay to the side of the lake when there's lots of water skiing going on or other boating. Um, and really the biggest threat is the kayakers and the canoeists during, this, during the nesting time. Because they're the ones poking in around the shorelines and getting on close. The motorboats are out 50 to 100 feet for the most part. So there's, you know, it's kind of a, you don't think of that as the, the big thing, but really it's the, those of us who think we're really, really respectful are <laughs> causing the most problems. But, um, so that's, yeah, and once they get used to that, then, yeah, they can tolerate it to a point. Green River Reservoir, I mean, you can go right by those birds and they may not flinch. But let's say they just had an interaction with another loon or they're a little set off and you come by and they're just alert, all of a sudden they'll go do a penguin dance right next to you and blow up and you're, you're terrified. Um, they see one of these birds, you know, right up with their bill right in front of your face. So sometimes it depends on their demeanor too. Or we got individuals who are very paranoid and we have individuals who are not. It's a, it's a spectrum. Um, Greenwood Lake, I don't know if anyone knows that. It's a really sinuous, small, 80-acre lake. And there's no more than maybe 400 feet at the widest point, point. I mean, maybe 600 in a few spots. Well, that male, the first year they nested back in 2002, if you got within a quarter mile, it was beelining it towards you to call at you to go away. It was that defensive. And it wasn't helping its cause. Um, you know, because no, you couldn't paddle on the lake without getting confronted by this male loon. Um, eventually, actually, they didn't nest for the next 10 years. They just started nesting again two years ago. Um, 
which is kind of an interesting case with the, the, the people aspect. They started nesting on an island no bigger than this room, with a cabin half the size of this room. And I've learned that that person doesn't like loons. <laughs> um, he's even got a great name, but I'm forgetting it. <laughs> it's not quite Bubba, but it's close. <laughs> um, and so I was able to find his phone number and find it. We actually were out there putting a raft. This is one place we'll use a nesting raft. We put it in a cove that's quiet hoping the birds would go to the cove, because um, we'd heard that they'd been nest building the year before. So we were kind of on the alert. So we went out there, got that raft out. We got out there, the pairs around, no big deal. I come out a week later, just trying to check, and there they are, throwing mud and sticks onto that island. So I quickly got hold, or well, we went to the town clerk the next day when it was open, called the guy in Barry, and asked if we could put a fence up. Just a little garden fence, you know, nothing you know, bigger than that, to see if we could keep the loon actually off the island. If it nested there, it'd be a failed nest, unless we decided to get the game wardens involved. And loons are to the point we don't need that. Um, you know, we can have some failures and they'll be okay. It's actually almost sometimes good if they have a failure in a bad spot, because they're more likely to nest in a different spot the next year or a re-nest. So um, anyway, so we got permission. The next day, two days later, I get out there. They luckily hadn't laid eggs yet, but they were working on that nest like crazy. They were building the bowl, and I went out. It was horrible. I, I had to actually force the birds away. You know, they're doing calls and dancing and you know, you're just like, oh my gosh, this is not what I want to be doing. But put the fence up and two days later they were on the raft. So somehow they found it and you know, they, you know, they know their lake if it's, a, if it's a contained area. It gets harder on big lakes when you're trying to force them into a certain areas. But it, it can work. It doesn't always work. Um, they ended up having a failed nest. Just they abandoned after a while. But this year they were successful and had a chick. Um, so it's on the raft. On the raft again, mm -hmm. yep. Once they kind of find a good site, they tend to come back to it year after year. There's probably nest sites out there that have been used for a thousand years, <laughs> um, unless there's been major water fluctuation. Um, I don't really know. But um, anyway, so that's, that's kind of a neat thing. And now we have you know, some great volunteers. They're right on the raft. They're, you know, they're taking care of it and everything else. So any other thing pop to mind? Yeah. So I was probably under this myth for many years that um, if a lake has loons, that's a They, they're definitely an indicator of certain things, but not all things. Um, and yeah, a lot of people have really tried to make this loon the, you know, the, the pyramid of, you know, if loons are on it, you got a great lake. No, loons can tolerate a heck of a lot. And they can tolerate, probably there's a threshold, there's somewhere there's a, a limit where lakes do, might, might become too busy. And yes, they're going to leave it. We, I think we kind of see that on lakes where they're not established. Um, moreover, in the St. Catherine Bomacene area, we got some loons that might hang out for a little while, and then all of a sudden, they're gone. Um, come June, July, uh, so we've we've seen that on some lakes. But then once they can find a spot, they they seem to tolerate it and get through that nesting period because nesting is in May and June, for the most part, in early July. So if they can find a spot that's good and and we can help keep that quiet, if it is a busy lake, um, that can make a difference. So, but yeah, they they definitely aren't necessarily an indicator of a the super pristine lake. But they probably are an indicator of a lake that at least has decent um, resources for fish. If it's, if it's uh, definitely poor in that, they're probably not going to do so well. Um, definitely some habitat if they are going to nest. Um, although, again, some of these busy, busy lakes, they do serve as refuges for the non-breeders, a, a safe place to hang out. So it's not bad to have some of that. Um, it's a good mix in, in that regard to show, um, with how busy our lakes are in this state. And, you know, I, we're off the endangered species list and we're actually in the throes right now of do we keep this program going where we monitor every single pair and try to keep track of every bird, so to speak, um, or do we kind of detune it and do a little sampling, keep the you know, volunteer thing going on those lakes and focus volunteers to these, these areas that we're trying to sample. You know, and by sample, we're going to actually play with some numbers. Do we need to do a 30%, 60% to really be able to detect changes quickly in the population? You know, it's kind of, that's actually what I went to school for, was to play with those things. So it would be kind of fun to go do this exercise. On, on, a, on the other merits, it's based on the volunteers and the connections that we make, it, would, it makes full sense to keep the program full tilt. And you know, in full tilt, it's a five and a half, six month position. So it's not like it's a huge position or job. But we also don't have that many loons compared to Minnesota and Maine and all of that. So, um, but, you know, loons have become a very big part of Vermont. Yeah. Well, loons uh, nest on the Connecticut River? Haven't had any documentation. 
Um, and, but definitely use it, especially the slow bits. Um, I did a canoe trip third week of June, maybe about five, six years ago, and I had three adult loons just kind of hanging out um, along the river. So definitely they will um, be there. They have nested on more reservoir. Uh, we've had loons hanging out in Comerford Dam quite a bit, Mackinac Falls. So, um, and they're definitely lots of nesting up on the Connecticut lakes. Um, but uh, they've never been that successful anymore for some reason. Yeah. How much do you coordinate with your colleagues in New Hampshire with the Loon Preservation Committee? Um, not as much as we should, but at the same time, we do. We get together every spring for a, a day and a half meeting of just you know sharing what, what the research is, what our education goals are, what our management strategies are, and so we we we're always sharing ideas on how to do things better. If we get a case in of um, dealing with a loon caught on a, a small pond, or a, we've actually gone through a lot of iterations of this, but situations where we're like, oh, geez, what do we do? Um, how do we deal with a loon that's nesting? Here's the dock, here's the nest. You know, can, and the people really want to use their, that land. What do we do? Well, they, they actually have done some maneuvering, move, man, maneuvering of nests onto a raft, move it down the shore a bit. So we were in constant contact doing something like that. Um, we share outreach materials. Um, Anyway, yeah, so there's lots of sharing in that way, our, our, a lot of our procedures, our protocols. Um, we're working on getting our data sets all lined up. Because, yeah, because New Hampshire and Vermont have the biggest data sets, longest running data sets in the world for common loon. Um, for this level of detail, we're really watching every lake. So. Um, I go to a lake in Maine, and loons nest on this small island for years and years and years. And they failed for two years. And last year, it was because the water level rose because we had rains in July and it drowned the eggs. But this year, something ate the eggs. And I was wondering, what would eat the eggs on a very small island? Anything that could get out there, but yeah, um, mink, okay. otter. Eric, can you repeat the question? Oh, oh yeah, um, a, a small island. Last year, their nest flooded. This year, the eggs got predated. And so what, what, what could get an, out to an island and eat the eggs? Um, you know, raccoons can swim. What, um, would a water snake do that? I haven't heard of that. We have a big snake that lives. <laughs> <laughs> I can see some southern snakes, but I'm not sure about the ones that are up here. So me uh, would be the most. And uh, uh, ravens, eagles. Well, it's covered. I mean, it's okay. Berry bushes. And yeah, um, although you know that they, uh, especially a raven, potentially could get in there. Uh, but yeah, those are all possibilities, and it's probably the most common uh, reason nests are lost. So I go here and then over here. So go ahead. I was thinking this in mind with some of these questions. What about these small ponds like Ken Pond, which have very limited boat use, you know, you can only go two miles an hour, that sort of thing. Are those ponds more successful than the sort of more wide open, sort of more generally utilized ponds? It's, it can be highly, what is the most successful pond? Is it the smaller ponds that tend to have slower boat traffic versus others? I think actually it comes down to really good nest sites. Um, but one of the neat things, I mean, hopefully in the next few years, we're actually, VCE is hiring a new science director um, and who's got a lot more stat, stats behind him and all of that. And so we're hoping to take our data sets and be able to do some of this analysis, although part of it's finding funding to, time to do it, but to give you some really interesting questions of what makes success. Why have we seen the population explode? What lakes aren't? Um, you know, we have, a, we have a, lot, a lot of lakes out there where they've tried nesting six years in a row and failed every time. We got other lakes where they've been nesting for 33 years out of 34, and they produced 40 some chicks in that time period. And then they just cranked them out. So, you know, there's, it's a lot of variability. Um, and it, part of it depends on which lake has the most predators on it. Um, that can be huge. So. Yeah. How long does a lake or pond have to be for them to, to get up off the water? Yes. It depends on the tree line. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, they do. What do they need a runway? How small a pond can they be on? And yeah, there are limits. And uh, there's definitely uh, they landed on farm ponds quite a bit. Exactly. And that's, I've, I've actually averaged out. I spend 60 to 80 hours a year trying to catch loons. Um, so this might be a good segue into some of those. But the farm pond is always the interesting one. If there's a nice open field and no tree line, we often give them time to see what they can do on their own. Because catching a free swimming loon is not easy. Um, catching a loon with chicks is actually about 90% successful. We, we imitate a third bird. Um, 
and I'll, I, I, I was actually started loons back in 1991, catching and banding them. Um, and you do a little, that's the chick whistle. And we get really close, you know, I'll be pretty mean to the camera or something, and we're in a boat, we got a spotlight on it, million power, candle power light, and it's kind of swimming there with the chicks, and I'll do that little whistle, and it'll just kind of turn its head, and it might just come right into me. Um, we'll also sometimes play another loon call, especially the whale call, the W-A-I-L. That's kind of a um, sort of identification call, so there's not as much threat associated with that. So we don't get the family riled when we're, this is when we're intentionally catching them for uh, blood sampling, for banding. In fact, pass out, pass that around. These are bands that would go on the leg. Um, there's a silver band and color bands. We put two color and a silver and a color on the other leg. And that way, all the birds are individually marked, and you don't have to catch them again to know who you're looking at. Um, the other thing I'm passing around is some fishing gear that I've taken off loons. Oh. Um, so, so anyway, for the, um, we're getting back to the ponds that are too small. Let me get to that first before I forget. Um, I've seen a loon actually take off from a, uh, an open area on the ice, less distance in this room. And I wouldn't have probably believed it had I not seen it. I was actually standing there. There were two loons swimming around in this patch of open ice, or open water in the ice. And one just took off. And I swear I could feel the energy from that bird as it just wanted to go. And it's, I mean, it just like flapped like crazy, got going, its feet are still hitting the ice. But again, he's got a half mile runway down the ice. He had enough momentum to keep him going. Add a slope to that with ground, they're gonna need more three, 400 yards. Um, but they, even then, they need to be able to get a little bit of lift to get above and circle around. Seven to nine, seven to ten acres, five to ten acres is about the minimum size we've had birds fly in and fly out of. Um, so they can do that. We did have a pond once where it was stuck there for about a week, and um, it sort of would take off, run, get to the end of the pond, and quickly drop. And it did that repeatedly. Finally, I think with a good wind going into it, and he figured out that the power lines wasn't moving, he had to go underneath the power line, um, that guy made it off. Uh, we had another one in East Peachum that was on the pond with a big dike, and there was only a gap, no wider than, I don't want to say less than two-thirds of this room. And we tried catching that twice. And you know, every time we put a spotlight on it, it dove. Every put a spotlight on it, it dove. We tried daylight capture. We weren't even getting close. It was just like cat and mouse. That mouse is getting away every time. And after, you know, twice and you know, three times trying to catch this bird, we're like, well, let's just wait and see what happens. We either wait for signs of it being weak. People lived across the road, so they could kind of watch it. It might take off and land in a field. I actually did a consultation in Virginia of someone who said they found a loon you know, on the shore, but they put it back in the pond. Um, I said, well, if it does it again, um, pick it up and bring it to a river or a you know, big wide river or a big lake nearby. Um, ends up that it happened a few days later. And it, it, exactly, it couldn't get off, but it really wanted to, and it got off, but landed in a field. It couldn't bail out quick enough. So, um, but by knowing what to do with a bird, we were able to get that one to move on, probably, and be okay. So these other small ponds, though, we actually have done several ca capture techniques. And the, the new technique that I've played with, and I say I've um, played with it, I've only twice used it and been, been successful. I've done it two other times and not been successful, is instead of playing that whale call, I go pretty much immediately to a yodel call, which is the male territorial call, um, sort of a crescendo and then this up and down, up and down. And only the male does that. And so playing that on a tiny little pond, all of a sudden this bird who's been alone for a few days or a week, or in one case, um, I don't know if anyone heard the story three years ago up in Williston, uh, a bird that landed on the fire retention pond for Shaw's and Maple yes. Tree Place, yeah. the huge complex there, Task Corners, oh um, next to Friendly's. <laughs> um, it was swimming around in this thing and um, for two months. And we had people watching it. It was near the Fish and Wildlife Office. Someone was checking it pretty much every other day just to, okay, is it there, is it not there? But I saw osprey come in and take fish. I saw cormorants come in and take fish. I mean, there was, there was some food in there for it to eat. Um, lots of goldfish that had gotten about this big. Um, I don't know how good the diet was, maybe you know, McDonald's of the Loon World or something. So come two months later, July, we decided let's get the okay to go see if we could get this bird. Um, 
And so I called up Maple Tree Place. They put me through to Chicago, uh. to the, the managing organization of that place. Um, I had our office director uh, fax them a certificate of insurance. Ends up, ends up we didn't have enough insurance. To do it. And they said, we can't let you go out there. Uh, so I'm like, oh boy. All these thoughts ran through my head. Okay, which, which ones are appropriate? Um, and uh, so I came up with a list of things. Like, okay, I'll work with the state police. You know, they, they'll totally help me out, and I'll be under, you know, they're in charge, I work under their insurance, they have to have enough insurance. Um, another one was, um, uh, oh, what was it, um, I'm just going to sneak out there anyway after midnight, <laughs> and just do it. Um, and another one is, let the public know that there's nothing we can do. Um, and that's not an answer they really wanted to hear, and I, I was very polite in the way I phrased that one. Um, so, and it ended up, they let us do it, and we did actually have the Williston police watching us when we did it, because um, they had nothing else to do, but I, you know, <laughs> I had no call, so they got to, this was their evening entertainment. And we went out there, we had a little 12 foot boat, electric trolling motor, played the whale call, and like I was mentioning earlier, the loon just dove, gone. And this is a good 300, 350 foot pond by 100, 150, so it's not small in the regard of, you know, you're not going to be right on top of it by luck. Because um, that has happened before, where we just chase and chase and chase, and finally the loon pops up next to us, and we get lucky with a net. These are big salmon dip nets that we use. So anyway, I went, after about 10 minutes, I went to the yodel call. And all of a sudden, that bird is staying up on the water. And think about it is, okay, you have a friendly communication call, you know, who, you know what's going on. But it's a loon, I I've been on this pond by myself for two months, and um, it's a little strange, so I'm getting out of here. So I'm diving. But now all of a sudden you got an angry male who's arrived after two months. What do you do? And so most birds are actually going to defend if they don't have anywhere to go. And so this bird actually stayed upright, and we, we actually had that bird within five minutes. Where it just kind of stayed in the light, stayed in the light. The light kind of confuses it, you know, it's wondering what to do, and finally we nabbed it. And then I went to put bands on that bird, and the legs were too small for the bands I'm ha handing around. Um, anyone know why? No? Nope. nope, not nutrition or anything like that. It's where they're from. A Minnesota loon, or actually a Saskatchewan loon, is going to weigh four to eight pounds. A Maine loon is going to weigh from more like nine to 16 pounds. Wow. Um, our average weights in Vermont are about 10 pounds for a female and about 14 pounds for a male. So that bird is probably from northern Quebec. And it came through May 22nd. There's often a delayed migration. We had 40 loons show up on Island Pond on May 17th one year. All of our birds have been back for three to four weeks. And it's like all of a sudden there's 40 loons. The talk around town was, oh, they were cormorants. No, they were loons. They couldn't have been loons. You know, and they, they were loons. They were there for a day and they were gone. And they're just waiting for the ice to go out. Um, so there's this delay. And so this was a, a French bird, a French Canadian bird came in and kind of got waylaid at Traps Corners. You know, bad shopping. Want to go shopping? Yeah. What's the lifespan and how much of that time are they breeding? Uh, the guess is still 20 to 30 years. Um, I just got a report from the folks in Wisconsin that um, about two years ago they lost track of a loon that. I probably helped ban back in 91. Um, and that bird was, so that means it was 22 years old as an adult, because it was breeding at that time, and which also means it probably tack on at least five years to that. So that was probably a 25 year old loon. Um, and they breed on average at seven years of age, maybe six. So it's, there's a big delay for them to find a spot. And there, but there's now been a few cases of three year olds nesting. Um, but that's pretty rare. Um, most nesting really is, you know, wait, wait till they're five, six, seven, eight, um, and that's actually when you see the, the really the, um, those those birds in their prime, especially the males. The males tend to get bigger up to around seven, eight years of age, um, and then that's kind of where they stop. And those birds, uh, those seven, eight-year-olds, are the ones who are doing these things called takeovers, where they're actually going into a territory, choosing a fight, kicking a bird off, and the, the female, in this case, would accept the winner. And it's usually the intruder that once they decide to do a challenge, they are almost always going to win. They've discovered. They almost they wait until they know they're going to do it. Um, whereas those three, four, five-year-olds, a lot of those birds 
um, are, when they find a territory, are finding an unoccupied piece of water. Um, they're, they're not going after a, a challenge. So they're probably getting less prime real estate. Um, they're probably getting the, the fringes. Um, but you know, in a few years, they might then challenge somebody. Because it's probably about, it's about 80% of the time the same two birds come back. 20% of the time there's a switch in one of the birds. So that means about five years in a row, you might get a pair together. And then finally something happens and one gets replaced by another. And it can cause two or three years of sort of unrest before that pair gets reestablished. So you might have two or three years of no nesting or failed nest. Or if there's a switch in the male, they might even change nest sites. Males tend to be the ones who choose the nest sites they've discovered. Um, so some neat stuff there. How big a lake would you need to have two pairs? Like, how big a territory do they defend in order? 100, 150 acres. Uh, and so that said, a lot of it also depends on the configuration. So they like to be visually separate from each other. So a, a lake with two distinct bays with an island or peninsula in the middle, more likely to be able to have two pairs than a, a round open lake um, where they can see all the way across. Uh, so that's, that's a big factor. Our, we have a really unusual one, it's Peachum Pond. It's got three pairs on it. Um, it's only 340 acres. But there's a very distinct 60 acre bay to the north, and then there's probably about a 30, 40 acre cove in the southwest. And those two are the ones that have really done well. And then there's a southeast pair, I call it, that nests in this, this little notch. Um, and they've, they've nested maybe four or five times and failed every time. It's just, it's just not that good a site. <coughs> Partly, I think, predation, because it's not a really good marsh. We have, and there's gradations of good marshes and bad marshes for, for nesting. It's the marsh with the hummocks that have a little water around them and a lot of shrubbery and wet areas versus the one that just is right next to the open woodland or the hard upslope. Up Rarely do loons nest successfully on um, sort of hard shorelines. So maybe about five years ago, I started drawing the distinction between a marsh nest and a shoreline nest, and shoreline being a more hard surface. And this year we had nine shoreline nest attempts. Three were successful. Um, whereas the other nesting for a marsh nest tends to be in the 60 to 70% success range. Islands, 70 to 80%. And rafts, 80 to 90%. Um, the smaller the island, the better too, because you're more, less likely to have a predator on it. Uh, distance from shore can also make a difference there too. So lots of things there. What can you say about the loons on Lake St. Catherine who don't nest there? <laughs> Probably young birds um, who are just kind of biding their time figuring out where they're going to go next. And it's a real curiosity, that whole Lake, Lake St. Catherine up to Bomacine, and then including Lake Champlain, who are the loons that are hanging out on those lakes? Um, are they New York birds, Adirondack? Are they Vermont? Are they Quebec? Um, because, and I can say that because they've discovered through um, banding and also now through telemetry that loons especially the males, tend to re return within 10 to 15 miles of their natal lake. Mm -hmm. Females, 20 to 30, but some females have, not, have been further afield. Um, so think about that. You're a chick <clears throat> of the year. You're, you're, you're growing up. It's, it's getting to be October. Your parents are leaving you a lot more. Um, they're going to a lake nearby. And finally, in mid-October or late October, you don't see them again. And you're, you're a chick hanging out on this lake. The ice starts forming at the end of November, and you're like, uh-oh, what do I do now? And we always get several close calls each year, and usually one or two that get stuck. Some we can help, some we can't. Um, and they make their way, you know, puddle jumping to the ocean. And they did a telemetry a satellite implant in a one chick from the Adirondacks. Um, that bird took 60, no, 53 days going down the um, western, eastern New York before ending up in Long Island Sound in January. So it was probably just finding open water, staying there, finding open water, staying there, it freeze, you know, and getting off just in time, and finally made it to the ocean in that bit of time. Whereas all the adults that had telemetry units, all but one, this is 10 birds, made it to the ocean in less than two days. And most of those probably did it in one day flight, um, possibly direct. There was one bird that stopped at Lake Champlain for a day, stopped somewhere in southern Vermont for a day, and then it took five to six days for that bird. Um, whereas the Minnesota... Uh, Ontario, uh, Manitoba birds, they're going to sort of stage in the Great Lakes for several weeks. They often, a lot of them might be going to the Great Lakes right now, and they'll be there until no November, end of November, and then they'll, some will go within two or three days down to the Gulf of Mexico. So Chicago to New, or New Orleans in three days. Other birds might stop on a 
river or a reservoir or a lake, and there are a few lakes down in that area, but lots of reservoirs now, so those are good staging areas. Out west, there's, um, a, oh, I'm forgetting the name of the lake in California, but loons will stay a month there before they, they'll go and they'll fly directly to and from the Gulf of California, um, up to northern, actually it's in Nevada, sorry, this lake in Nevada, and then they'll make their way up to Saskatchewan and Alberta. Um, so there's kind of a divide in the, the migration routes right there. Um, and this is, a lot of this has all gotten, been known just in the last five to six years with telemetry birds. And if you actually Google that, um, it's the USGS Loon Migration Site. You can actually, um, if there's live birds with telemetry units, you can actually see where those birds are this minute. Um, it's pretty cool. But you can also go to all the old records from the last 10 years, pick a loon and see how it moves, and it'll show a date in this location. And as, it'll be a close-up in northern Wisconsin, and all of a sudden, it, boom, as it takes off to further places afield. So it's a really neat site if you want to learn a little bit more about the, the migration movements. We've also got a lot of banded birds that have been recovered um, and observed. And we've only had one, we, back in 99, 2000, we banded maybe 25 adults, and one of those birds has been found on Martha's Vineyard, and that was from Island Pond. So you know, it kind of fits the bill of where, where we're at. Tell me about how you build a raft. Well, I'm actually kind of lucky um, in where I live that we have lots of cedar trees. Whereas other parts of New England, and actually the New Hampshire biologists came over this spring to go get cedar um, because it's the cheap way to do it. Um, I get mine for free because I do trail work and I'm cutting cedar trees all the time for ski trails. I didn't even really think about it, but our soils are such that the cedars do really well up in this part of northern Vermont and the Piedmont region. Um, so four to five foot logs. Um, I'll put usually two big guys on either end and then some medium ones this way and then another real small one right across the middle. And so it's a big square, a mesh on top. Um, and right now I'm just using snow fence of some sort, but I've also used uh, lobster trap mesh, uh, which I might do again because it's lasting forever and you can take it off and reuse it. Because the rafts will last five to ten years. Um, although I've learned to keep them more buoyant by putting marine foam underneath with a raft in plastic, um, that construction stuff. Um, so. I, and then you have cables. And I've learned to put two cables on each, well, on two corners instead of just one, right. um, just for the wear and tear and they break. Um, but it's by putting four cables total on two opposite corners and then anywhere from three feet to 10 to 15 feet of cable yeah. that can rise and fall with water level changes. Because that's where we use the rafts the most. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to be putting out two new ones down in the Lake Dunmore area um, on r reservoirs that go up and down by one to four feet. Wow. Um, mm -hmm. Silver Lake. Uh, and Goshen Dam, or Sugar Hill Reservoir, wow. and they nested on Silver Lake successfully, first time ever, wow. um, just above Dunmore. Uh, Dunmore's a really kind of neat story, because that um, was one of the places Zadok Thompson, the, a naturalist from the 1800s, wrote about loons formerly nested on um, Bomacine, Dunmore, Caspian, and he listed off a few others. And those, they were gone. They were, I mean, Dunmore was one of those places you'd see them fly in. I worked at Kuwaitan Environmental Ed Camp in the spring there. I'd see them in late April, early May, and then they're gone. Um, and that was just you know, six, six, 18 years ago. Um, and then that continued up until about 10 years ago. And then finally we had some birds that were sticking around for one or two years, and then all of a sudden there was a pair one summer swimming around. And that's, that's where volunteers are actually the, one of the biggest assets, is identifying pair-like activity. And it's repeated sightings of two birds consistently for about two months. If we have that, we want to watch that lake more closely. And so that puts it on my radar if I don't have people there to make sure I do, or I get there myself a lot more. And Dunmore was one of those cases. Where would they nest on Dunmore? We look at the habitat. There's one island. There's some marshy stuff at the north, but the island is you know, prime as if they're going to choose. And sure enough, that next year, the pair was seen cruising around the island. And so we had a bunch of people started popping up out of the net, you know, you know, here, I'm watching the loons. And sometimes that happens, sometimes it doesn't. <clears throat> and so finally they, they, we saw them nest building. We got hold of, well actually we got hold of the landowner sooner, got permission to put nest warning signs out around that lake, around that island. And so within a, a day or two of them actually starting to nest build, we had signs out. Um, and, and then we were to all the stores, we were to the campgrounds with information. And it's just, it's one of those little neat things. And this is almost 100 years to the date after that published account. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of neat to see the loons are, are back on a place like that. And it's, it's really where like a management's going to have to continue. 
is places like that. And you know, Loon's probably about 50 to 60 percent of the nest sites I consider moderate high to high risk. Um, that's whether it's due to shoreline activity or boating activity or just a you know, really crowded, busier lake. Whereas the other 40 or 50 percent probably could just be totally hands off and they'll be fine. Um, they'll have some failure here and there. They'll get off nest once in a while, but they'll get back on. Things like that. See, I've, I've missed some people. Back here. Um, um, those are probably getting into western Ontario and maybe in northern Quebec a little bit. Um, possibly, we've, we've definitely had uh, a Maine bird who kind of went, kept going. It, he didn't stay up there. You know, may, maybe that one's smarter than the rest. You know, a little warmer, a little easier to eat and fish. Um, and then you got other birds from further over who come, who come across and might just stick out, stay. There's, it doesn't seem like they tend to have as much of a, a territory in the winter. They tend to float around a little bit more. But that said, there was a, a crew went down after the big oil spill in the Gulf uh, of Mexico from Biodiversity Research Institute and started doing a bunch of banding. And catching a loon in the Gulf in the wintertime is it's easier than doing a random bird in the summer. They're, they tend to, be, tend to be less skittish, but it's still like just boating around with a net and uh, can I get something. But they have gotten a lot and they put bands on them and there was one year they put two telemetry units in these guys. One went straight up um, through Tennessee up to Lake Michigan, up to Lake Superior, and when the guy caught it, he's like, is this even a loon? It was so small. He'd never handled a loon so small, and I can't remember what the weight was, but he'd handled a lot of Minnesota loons, and they're tiny um, relative to ours. Um, and it went to northern Saskatchewan, so probably the epicenter of small smallness. <laughs> probably, you know, they're just, they got the biggest migration distance, and that's probably why they're small. It's more efficient to be a uh, and you got to, it's a trade-off because it's e the bigger you are, the more you can hold the ter easier you can hold the territory or defend it. The other bird though went over the and crossed the Panhandle of Florida, <laughs> went up to the Chesapeake, then up to Lake Erie, then Lake Huron, and then went right up next to his buddy up in northern Saskatchewan. <laughs> Not it wasn't I mean it was by next door it could have been a hundred miles away or three or four hundred miles away, but relatively that next fall, they did the same reverse migration. One went straight down, one went way over. So it's what they learned. Um, and they're doing a kind of a, a pretty interesting project right now in Minnesota. Um, through this group, Biodiversity, there's parts of southern Minnesota where the range is, um, they're, they're no longer. They used to nest down into Iowa. Um, they used to nest down into Indiana and Pennsylvania. So there's been a big range contraction over the last 150 years. And lots of factors to do with that. Midwest, it's probably more farming, um, and just the, um, the the lakes that are around that. But but there's also now been a, a little bit bigger rebound in some of the habitat preservation around some of those lakes, or at least the shorelines. Um, and so they're kind of experimenting with a reintroduction. And it's not like hacking a um, a peregrine where you raise the young in captivity, go to the cliff site, let the bird kind of start moving in and out, feeding it there. This one, they actually got permits to go to northern Minnesota where there's tons of loons. They actually caught some chicks at seven to eight weeks of age and brought them to southern Minnesota where there's no loons within 150, 200 miles. And to colonize that, think about it. Remember what I said? Loons return to their natal lake area. So it's going to take a long time for natural occurrences to loons to expand back out into that. So they're going to experiment, um, partly in an area where there's lots of loons, to see what happens with these chicks. And so they, they released them in these pens so they could provide food, they could catch them, they could do a blood analysis and other um, measures of hormones and stress levels and just really monitor the health of these birds closely. Um, and then at one point they released the birds um, out of these lakes. And the I hope is that they become imprinted on these lakes. And that's what they're going to return to in two years. More likely three years or four years. Most loons don't return back to their area until they're three or four, in some cases five. Most one and two year olds all spend the winters on the ocean. Um, we'll call them, they're called immature loons, but I, that was another term people I found confusing because they think chicks are immature. Um, and those are juveniles um, for, the, for the, the correct term. So I call the um, immature subadults. And they're this stage where they're gray and white, they look just like a big chick for the most part. Um, and oh, before I forget, I'm going to do some handouts. There's two different handouts. One is on the natural history. It's all a guide for boaters. It's also on the management. Um, and the other one is a guide for lakeshore owners. 
and a lot of on wildlife for shorelines and why we need to do more to protect our shorelines um, and manage our shorelines better, um, just for the health, health of the lake. So we're talking about loons as a sentinel. I think they can be a sentinel for people because people will care about a critter they like to follow. And if they know that loons need a healthy shoreline for the bugs, the aquatic insects, the eggs, the coolness of the water, the oxygen in the water, the sediment runoff, I mean, all these things that you need to have a healthy lake, um, especially because a good chunk of that's coming from the shorelines, uh, maybe we can get people to think about their shorelines in a slightly different aspect, rather than saying, you know, you need to create a buffer to prevent phosphorus from getting into your lake. Well, no, you need to create a buffer to help those loons so they, that we don't lose track of, or lose, lose ground on what we've done over the last 30 years. Um, and so with that, in the new shoreline bill that went, that got passed this past spring, hopefully um, we'll start turning the corner the other way as people realize, hey, you can still have a lakefront that doesn't have to be grass um, or open country. So, so a question about an observation we had. Sure. In the fall, we saw maybe eight or ten loons in a circle. Yep. Dancing. It's phenomenal for us. What were we watching? What were they doing? That's the... Is it the $60 million question? <laughs> um, that is really the one big area of loon behavior that has not been really figured out. What is going on in these social gatherings? And social gathering it means four, five, six, or 20, or 100 loons all together kind of rafting up doing stuff. It tends to happen more come midsummer into the fall. Later in the fall, it kind of makes sense. They're kind of getting ready for migration. They don't necessarily migrate together like geese, but they will go through two and three at a time. They'll lift off together. Um, and there was a place on Lake, Her uh, Lake Michigan, or, yeah, Lake Michigan, where I was I, working in a bird observatory. Over 2,000 loons flew over in two hours, Whoa. Oh my God. but spread out. Right. They're lifted off from here on and we're headed up. Um, but that's not what's happening in August when you see 10 loons kind of circling about. Um, is it just getting to know each other? and their territories, and who's where, and who's doing what, and, you know, hey Mary, hi Joe. Um, I think there's a lot of that, actually, that they are just getting to know their neighbors. Um, and it also is some possible territory stuff going on as far as, okay, you nest over there, how's your relationship? Um, can I do something next year and do a little takeover? And, and, um, you know, totally anthropomorphizing here, but there are some of this is going on. Um, and. That's probably the biggest one, but it's much different than just having one bird coming in and visiting a pair. There, it's really more obvious that there's distress, there's, you see their bills down, they're kind of aggressive at each other, where these big groups aren't necessarily so. You often don't see aggression associated with the big groups. Occasionally you do see some aggression, um, and you kind of wonder what's going on there. They were displaying. Yeah, um, yeah, but it could also just be... Um, displacement behavior, where they just kind of do something because they need to, you know, right. scratching your head, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. They'll do a little wing flap. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's a bunch of that possibly going on. And so that's the, you know, a real kind of neat thing, but it's also really, obviously, wonderful to see. I have to say, last week I was listening to the bird show on Vermont Edition, and they were talking about the effects of climate change on bird populations in, the, in Vermont. And the loon was one of the ones that she mentioned as possibly being affected by global warming, climate change in this area. And I'm thinking, trying to figure out what it would be, what kind of change would most directly affect. Probably the, the water quality yeah. and um, oxygen levels, pH. Um, they've, they've associated uh, loon presence and absence highly with pH. Uh, and the more acidic, just there's all sorts of things happening when that happens with the aquatic life. And so there's EPA's been working on this stuff for quite a bit. And so it, it doesn't take much for temperature rise to start changing the water chemistry. If we need more brochures, I have more up here. But um, in fact, we could break out two piles and start handing them out um, or get them afterwards. So that's probably a big one. Um, but they're also going to be affected by ocean changes. Um, what are they going to overwinter with? One of the things Tufts is seeing is um, slightly uh, more fungal disease in their lungs. And it's probably something that's always there, 
but all of a sudden they're seeing more of it, and they're seeing it more in summer birds. They used to never see it in summering birds. It was only in the wintering birds. Probably a high stress um, bird that gets a little weaker, and all of a sudden the fungus can boom, take off in the lungs. Aspergillosis is what it's called. And so immune deficiency is a, is a big concern in the bird world. I mean, all, I mean actually throughout. Um, when, and what's climate change and the stress that that's going to add on. So again, it comes back to, you know, you hear Deb Markowitz talk about resiliency. It's, okay, how do we create an environment that's going to have more resilience, reduce those stressors? Um, is there anything that can be done? Um, so maintaining shorelines, making sure that what we can do for aquatic life and health is, is good. Um, you know, those are, those are little things that can all add up, I think, hopefully. And so to, to put a little positive light on that side. Some other questions? Right here. Yeah. Do you think that what you've done, what society has done, explains the this dramatic increase in the number of moons? Are you, I are hope you, so. Are you <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, we, um, I, I, I've uh, worked with several students, interns, um, and I did a, a senior applied research project with a Sterling College, which is the town I'm in, um, where she actually looked at nests with nest warning signs, nests without nest warning signs. But the, the thing that I had her do was to look at the vulnerability of the nest. A lot of recreational studies have always looked at the lake scale. You know, how many cabins on the lake, boat access areas, um, you know, cabins per shoreline, things like that. Well, I'm, you know, Joe's Pond. You know, they're nesting, they're pulling off chicks left and right. That totally goes against the grain on using lake scale measurements to figure out how, how good is an, a, a site. So we went to the nest scale. How exposed is the nest? Is it on an island? Is it in a marsh or shoreline? Is it on a point? Is it on a boat channel? Is it, you know, what's the proximity of the nearest cabin in the house? Um, what's the density within 1,000 meters or 2,000 meters? And so we kind of came up with a, you know, a real simple study for her to do, and it would be great someday to do this in a really detailed way. And it wouldn't take much with GIS these days to, to make this happen. Um, and we came up with a figure that, if we were able to sort of isolate high-risk sites and low-risk sites, what was the difference? And on the high-risk sites, nesting success was about, I want to say, 78 percent, 75 to 78 percent, and on compared with signs, and on the high-risk sites that don't have signs, which aren't that many because we put signs out more than other places, although we wanted to use New Hampshire data as well, um, was down around 40 or 50 percent. So there was a huge difference, and this is comparing high-risk sites, not low-risk sites. Um, so that was a way to kind of filter out. And so that's the only study that I've seen looking at the signs and, and the effect of the management there. The rafts are really effective. I mean, you just look at a raft, no raft. Um, but um, what's interesting is we're actually trying to remove rafts when we can. Our population is doing really well in Vermont, and we're trying to promote natural nesting for the side of the long-term um, sustainability, um, finance, I mean, there's all sorts of reasons. It's more of a, partly a philosophical approach to what, how much do we man-made create and manage. Yeah. And let's see if we can reduce some of these, except for the reservoirs that go up and down, or the loons that nest next to someone's cabin. Let's see if we can maybe remove a few rafts and see what happens. Some of those birds have quickly switched to natural sites and done well. Other birds just have not found a very good nest site and haven't done well since we've <coughs> removed the raft. But our population is still growing. Um, and it's actually to the point in the, um, where we're starting maybe seeing a little bit of a plateau. The lakes in northern and north central Vermont are saturated. Um, every lake, big lake over 100 acres, got, has a, a loon pair on it, almost. I mean, I want to say, I think there's only a handful of the lakes that size that don't have pairs. Um, and this is the first year we've actually seen a big drop in productivity. Um, and I wouldn't say it's total numbers. We still had over 60 chicks survive and 70, or actually no, 90 something hatch out. But we had more chicks disappear, we had more failed nests. And I'm able to contribute a good chunk of that, almost 30 to 40 percent potentially, this is their total guesswork because it's all based on what people are seeing, intruder loons. Um, wow. Birds are defending more, they're out defending and the chick disappears during that time. Um, the other part is that we had six or seven, we had one eagle take a loon chick this year, observed, and we had six eagles observed on lakes where the chick disappeared that day, or the, or the day within a day. That's suspect. Um, it is suspect, but we just, it's good to know. Um, 
<laughs> that's why, but it's just, without people out there watching, we wouldn't have any clue. And again, it's all suspect. That's why I say it. it's only one in the report that got... <laughs> but, but it's in the little notes. Um, because some of those, those notes are what actually make, make a difference in how you manage um, and do things like that. You know, those, we had three lead birds. You know, yes, or today was the scientific advisory group meeting up in... Um, I assume they're in Montpelier now. They used to, um, oh, no, it's the Bird Museum of Vermont. And it's this group that, that sort of looks over the, all the bird populations and recommends what gets listed, what doesn't get listed. Um, and so they keep following loons. But, boom, all of a sudden we got this pulse of lead that came back, even though we banned the use and sale of small lead sinkers. A jig, a jig was one of those, and the other ones we, don't, we aren't sure yet. Um, let's see. Susan, where are you? How long do we go? <laughs> Can we keep going for a while? I, I think at Ready? 8 o'clock we could invite people if, you know, to feel free to get up and go if you're, if you're ready. <laughs> and to hang around. We usually hang around for another half hour. So it's 8 o'clock. Don't feel shy if you're ready to go. We told you it would be an hour, so you're free to leave. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll hang around for another half hour or so and answer questions and chit chat. Yeah. Any other uh, good burning questions that are out there? I'll, I'll share some loon catching stories in a second. Right here. Yeah. This isn't a question, it's just an oh, right. I'm Thank from you. New Hampshire and I'm pretty active with the New Hampshire side of things. So I have some information over here that I have plenty of it that they sent me. The Loon Preservation that. Committee yeah. um, has a whole, I mean, they're, they're a magnitude bigger than we are as far as loon stuff. They have a whole loon center in Moultonboro. So if you're ever driving up toward Meredith and just beyond Meredith, toward, up that way, um, take a visit. It's a, it's a neat spot to go. Um, I also write and edit a small monthly newsletter, and I have done quite a bit of writing on loons, so I have some issues here that are about loons. It's called the Valley Green Journal. Yes. I want to tell everybody about a wonderful woman over in uh, Pleasant Lake in New Hampshire, Kitty Wilson. Uh, she writes this incredible um, newsletter. She's an expert photographer. She spends I don't know how many hours she spends on that lake taking these gorgeous photographs. Well, she has a newsletter going every <coughs> week, and she'll send it to anybody that wants to get on the list. If anybody wants to be on it, you can give me your email. I'll let her know. And that's a neat thing about, um, I think, loons on lakes is that they allow you know people to actually connect. It's something to talk about. It's kind of like the weather. Um, you know, it's like, oh, have you seen the chick today? Or you know, what's happened with the nest? Um, it really happens, yeah. and what's great is that I said I have 300 volunteers, but there's so there's probably 10 times that pe many people actually following the birds out there, and probably even more than that. I have no idea. I, I run into these people, and they're like, "Oh, I've heard about you," and you know, it's like I talk with so and so on the lake. You know, they're the loon people to them. You know, that's the loon lady or the loon loon guy on their lake, who then are kind of my contact and liaison. And so this networking has been just phenomenal. And when we get a bird that's in trouble. You know, within two phone calls, they found me. Um, and within three more phone calls, I have three or four people or emails who are out there ready to go watch and monitor. Because that's often the first step when we're dealing with a bird in distress, is just watch it. Um, I had two this week. Ends up, I'm almost 100% certain, they were doing what I've called extreme preening. Anyone? I'm not sure if I labeled that or not, because I feel like I saw it somewhere, but I'm not sure. But people have seen preening, where they kind of go back with their, you know, they're kind of... Uh, bill behind or the end of their feathers and they do a short little wing flap you'll see their bill in their chest or they'll roll over on their belly and you kind of see them waggle a foot up in the air well they're preening they're, they're putting an oil oily powder that there's a gland in the rear end called the uropygio gland that produces this oily stuff and they have to spread that on the feathers to keep them waterproof and if they don't do that every few hours a little bit it might take a few minutes but sometimes they'll go on for you know a half hour just doing that really a big big preen but once in a while especially right now they're growing in new body feathers. They're doing a partial molt. Um, they don't replace their flight feathers this time of year. Most birds do their flight feathers in the fall before they do their, their winter migration. Whereas loons can't afford that. They're taking care of chicks right up to the point that they're leaving. And so they can't afford to lose their flight feathers right now. They've got to be able to feed those chicks, make sure they're getting stronger. So they do a partial molt to make sure that they can maintain good body feathers. And now they're, they're, they're probably itchy. They're falling out. New ones are growing in, it's uncomfortable. Every once in a while they just want to flush all that out. They also get mites. Um, almost all birds have little mites in their feathers. And this is a way to really kind of get the water deep. 
and they will literally like stick one wing out and just kind of flap it and churn the water. I've seen them do somersaults. Mm -hmm. I've seen them do plunge dives and actually go underwater, come shooting up, down again, up, down again, just submerging themselves. And it's probably my most common phone call. We got a loon caught in fishing line, it's trying to get it off. <laughs> um, did you see the line? Did you see a hook? Did you see? Well, no, but I know it's getting something off. And so I said, you know, kind of back off and explain that it might be this, and then go back out in an hour or two, or tomorrow, and see what you see. How is the bird behaving? And, you know, 99 times out of 100, it's, yeah, that's what it was. Um, but, it, but the previous biologist to me, in her three summers of cruising around, never saw it. Um, and I think partly it happens a little bit more at this time of year, uh, when, when fewer of us are out there. So it's, it's kind of a neat thing. <clears throat> yeah? You may um, answer this material, but like in the last couple of months when we've been kayaking, we've seen a loon or loons on small ponds like Silver Lake and Barner mm -hmm. and Miller Pond and Stafford. Is it helpful to to email or something when we see one? Or, or yeah. is it like, yeah, people are watching those things, that's like no big deal? Um, the lakes that we don't have breeding, uh, those are the ones that are really helpful. Uh, are they using them or are they not using them? Uh, Silver Lake and Barner is a perfect example. Uh -huh. yeah. It's kind of on the edge of being a little small for a yeah. pair to ever form on it. But I've said that before, and all of a sudden we have a pair on something. Uh -huh. um, so I don't, I don't rule anything out anymore. They're nesting on Miller now, yeah, two, two years two. in a row. Yeah. So yeah. it's the only nesting pair in Vermont, somewhat close to here. Yeah. Um, until you get over to Woodward Reservoir, Kent Pond, and Lake Nineveh. Um, so yeah, and what I'm hoping in the next year, two years, to have an online form, where that would make it really simple and easy. Because right now, I have everybody email me or call me, and that's where half my time goes, is processing that. But there's also a big positive to that, because there's often a question with it, or a comment, or are you interested in helping on a longer, bigger scale, you know. And it's amazing, I think, that even though it's email, it's, it's almost like one-on-one -on -one contact that they're having. Whereas some of these other online programs, you, you don't even know, you know who's behind on the other end, you know, and, and you don't have any sort of, per is there a way to ask, I mean, there is a way to find out who they are and ask questions, but when it's all online, you kind of get that dissociation. But I think in, in the terms of efficiency, we're going to have to do that, um, but I'll try to make sure that people are really open and clear to, you know, call me and contact me. I kind of sometimes feel like a game warden, because I get calls at 6.30 a.m. and 10 p.m., because I'm working from home, um, and it's often, you know, a bird in trouble. And so it's, it's just kind of one of those things. It, it's part of the job, um, which is really kind of, you know, mostly fun. <laughs> I have a question about, I understand that there's not any nesting activity on the Connecticut um, in the Upper Valley, but do you see any migration activity here? Uh, yeah. What, to how much um, a few years, I was going to say a year ago or so, I put a blog out mm -hmm. about staging areas. Because mm -hmm. we were having bird lakes that were still frozen. That was a, a late, you know, mm -hmm. lakes frozen in early May. And pe people would see their pair fly over and then fly away again. At least they assumed it was their pair. Um, so they're they're waiting. And where are they? Where are they coming from? Um, a lot of these birds are on on places like the rivers that are opened up. Um, we don't hear about large numbers, so it's probably not most of them. But some of them are definitely using the rivers for staging in the spring. Um, we've had them in the Missisquoi and the Connecticut, definitely. So that's, those are those are good spots. Are they flying from further south during those little forays? They might be, because consider a loon can fly 60 miles an hour. It takes a lot of energy. Um, they're they're like kind of like a jet. They got to go fast, or they're going to fall out of the sky. Um, they probably have actually geese are, are less efficient, but somehow I, I'm wondering if they're I don't know. It, as far as the wing surface area to the body mass, um, wing, loons have one of the highest ratios um, of of weight to surface area. High wing loading. Yeah, wing loading. So. Um, Let's see. I was just going to maybe share a few other quick little stories if I can remember some good ones. Um, um, one was a, I got a call from a vet rehab, or a rehabber up in um, Kirby, Vermont. And she goes, well, I got this bird today, and I'm not sure, but I think it's a loon chick. And so I was like, well, what makes you think that? It's like, well, I can't, I mean, it's, you don't find little loon chicks in the ID books. Right. Um, you know, they find bigger ones or, or whatever. So she says, well, just, it's just, that, just a hunch. But it's like, well, do you know where it came from? It's like, no, someone just dropped it off um, because they took it away from somebody else who did, had kids and dogs and so maybe that shouldn't be there. And so she, she just kind of forgot to ask the question of where did it come before that. So 
Within an hour, we had tracked it down that these people were picnicking on Island Pond, and they found this beach sitting on the, or loons, or this loon chick sitting on the beach. And they thought it was a duck. Um, and they just thought it had been orphaned and was left alone. But, you know, it was going to die right there. So they picked it up, put it in a box, brought it home. And that's where the friend kind of found it. And, you know, there's chaos in the house. And, um, and this is within, this is about 12 hours later, so the evening. And so I went the next morning and picked it up. And I'm, I'm looking at my dates, and I'm like, well, the hatch date should be plus or minus three or four days, because we had that one pretty close that year. So I took the bird, definitely a loon chick, and I go out there, and I see two birds, adults, swimming right by me as I approach the nesting area. And I'm like, jeez, what's going on? This looked like, looked like a, an adult dealing with an intruder. They were just both so intense in their movements, and it wasn't the casual, relaxed movements that you see with a pair. So I go around the corner where the nest was, and sh there's a loon sitting on the nest. So this bird I had in my hand was less than 24 hours old. Oh my. Probably hatched the day before, in the morning. And what happened is that intruder loon was probably being dealt with by the parent, one parent, the other parent's on the, the nest, and somehow I told that chick to go to shore. And they do that. They call, it's called stashing the chick. Um, and they stash the chick when they deal with these intruders. And they'll do that when the chicks are 10 weeks old, too. They'll just, like, the chick will just disappear. Um, another very common phone call, that we've lost our chicks. Um, it's like, well, are they deal is there other birds around? It's like, yeah, yeah. It's like, well, just wait. And sure enough, they'll call it back. Well, obviously, wow. and they'll often go on to shore to get out of the way of the intruder so they don't get, chicks often get killed in these fights. Wow. Um, so I decided to wait for the other parent to come back before I released the chick. And so I sat there for three and a half hours with this, with this chick. And finally, here comes an adult swimming along. And then came the moment of truth, because I've also heard that if they don't identify that chick, they'll kill it. So I'm like, well, here goes, because you know, what else are we going to do? So I just paddled in as fast as I could, put the bird down, backed off, and the bird started um, tremoloing. You know, yeah. super agitated calls, what you usually think about. Yeah. You know, doing that over and over again. I'm like, uh-oh. You know, I'm like, is this going to go after it? Well, all of a sudden, the bird on the nest started yodeling. So the male's on the nest, wow. and I've never seen a loon yodel on the nest before. It ends up, it was total excitement. They, were, they <laughs> like, went to that chick, they started cooting it around, and you know, it, was a, it was pretty cool. Uh, wow. and, so it was, yeah. and so it was like, ah! Oh. The sunburn was worth it, because it was totally... <laughs> um, uh, kind of another neat one was uh, this loon that was getting iced in on Eligo. For some reason, we've had at least three or four birds on Eligo get iced in. This is right up in Greensboro, Craftsbury. And I don't know if it, the chicks just, if it's a genetic thing, they don't get off um, or what, but it's been three birds and I've rescued, one got off just in time. Um, and the other one got frozen in and that, that was the one that got, was in the pond or the hole that was as big as this room. And one got off and then the other one stayed. And we had a 20 below snap right before Christmas. It's kept the hole open. The hole was now the size of the couch. Swimming around, swimming around, and finally it froze open, or fro froze closed, which is actually a good thing that it was able to keep that hole open long enough that the ice was now three inches. Um, that's my, that's when I'll go out on the ice. Um, and um, one year I went out on an inch and a half um, with snowshoes and skis and a rope and someone else. And, <laughs> that was the first time I did up on Island Pond, and we, we scooted that bird down and it was fine, and we were able to get it to Lake Champlain. Well, this bird, same thing happened. Got on the ice, I was able to just chase it down. Um, I often, well, sometimes I'm checked by a vet, but oftentimes I'll just bring it straight to the Echo Center. There's a great spot to put, get down to the shore. It never doesn't freeze up till February, if that. It gives them a chance to kind of do their thing. Um, the next Eligo bird. Um, what was the next one? Oh, the next one was a bird that got. Um, chomped by a snapping turtle midsummer. The, the milfoil diver saw all this commotion of the loons. He went to investigate, and the adult's just going crazy on the water, and he sees this chick being pulled underwater, and he realizes it's a snapping turtle. And so he takes his paddle and just <laughs> fans the, the turtle on the head and lets the chick go. The chick goes off, all the, all the loons are off, and the snapping turtle's kind of dazed. Um, <laughs> Well, probably not two days. I mean, those guys are tough. Yeah. Um, well, three weeks later, the, we we're not seeing the chick anywhere for a week. No one's seen the chick. Ends up, there was intruder loons. That loon was in hiding for a week before that the intruder was kind of driven off after some time. And um, so it made it through. And then comes December. And the, both chicks are out there swimming. The adults are long gone. 
and they're not leaving. The ice is forming at one end, it's coming down, so I got my motorboat out. I could still get to the access. I went out and I boated right at the bird. I wanted to, I often do this for health checks. How good can it swim? I want to see, can it go underwater and stay under for 40 seconds, which is a typical dive length. And it did. It went down, it came up 200, 300 feet over there. I'm like, that bird can swim really well. Whether it can fly or not, you know, I was thinking of an injury from the snapping turtle. It ends up, the next day, it did another survey, it was gone. So maybe my harassment sort of said, okay, that's enough. It was, the lake was frozen three days later. So that, was, that one worked out. The other one, though, was a, a, a chick of the year swimming around, and some people noted that the wing was kind of off a little bit. And they were like, you know, is there something wrong with it that it can't fly? Um, we got a call from um, the resident. I forgot to call the game warden. Sometimes I do that. And the game warden got word of this, so he called the Woodbury Fire Department. They just had bought one of those in, um, uh, airboats, and they used it on Irene. It was the, w the winter after Irene, and, but they'd never used it on ice, because it was for ice rescues in the wintertime. There's ice fishermen. So they put a call out and said, ice rescue, Lake Elego, to the Woodbury and the Greensboro Fire Department. They forgot to add in loon at the end. <laughs> I show up, there's 20 pickup trucks, a rescue vehicle, you know, and they're all firing up this airboat, which is loud as hell. Uh, and two hours prior to that, an eagle was diving at that loon and actually almost, it actually was on the bird for a minute, um, and, but finally gave up. It, whatever, I guess the loon was too heavy, I don't, it, you know, you'd think it would have persisted, but, because that would have been a good meal. But it, it, it gave up, and so they, the warden and one of the guys went out, and they were able to get the bird, but then they couldn't get turned around because the, the boat kind of froze to the ice. <laughs> so it was good practice for them. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of the guys were, you know, kind of like, oh my god, a loon, what am I doing? <laughs> but by the time they got that boat fired up and they came back, they were all pretty, pretty gung-ho for it. You know, it was, it was a good experience that way. And I put a nice letter to the, in the local paper and thanking everybody. But it ends up, I took that bird to the vets I go to up at Hyde Park, and it did. It had a broken wing, most likely from a boat hit earlier that summer. And it just never set right, didn't recover. So we're like, what do we do? And when I heard about the off wing the day before, I kind of joked around to some people, you know, we need to put it on the interstate with, to the ocean. And some other friends were like, well, I'll, I'll, I'll go drive to Portland, Maine for the, for the weekend. And they were just kind of joking, and I was joking. Well, sure enough, it, this was the case. So I kind of called up Deb. Are you serious about maybe want to go to Portland tonight? For, it was New Year's Eve. <laughs> um, and it ends up that same morning I brought the vet, or the, the loon to the vet. Another loon, during a cold snap, got frozen in and made it off, but couldn't. Fl it didn't. Could, it wasn't big enough, so it was found next to a road. So we had a healthy loon that was stranded. We had my bird with a broken wing that could live. He could feed, he could preen, he just couldn't fly. He could live his, the next 25 years out in the ocean and be just fine. So I gave instructions with two loons and put them in their car and a handwritten note in case anyone questioned them. And, uh, and they felt like delinquents as they released them in the dark that night. So it was kind of, kind of a neat thing. So. Yeah, but... You know, maybe they'll get to go up to Allagash and <laughs> up, up that country. Um, I've done a red-throated loon once. They crash-landed on a pond that couldn't get off. And this time it could actually, red-throated can actually get off in the length of this room pretty easy. But it was a 60-foot tree line around this pond in Cambridge. And I went out with this guy, he must have been about 80, 82. Um, and it's 40 degrees out, 38 degrees out in mid-November. And we went out with a... Easy, careful now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And he was in his prime, ready to go. <laughs> and we just chased that bird up and down this pond and couldn't get close. It was, again, diving. We waited till dark and put the spotlights, and it was just enough confusion that he popped up next to the boat once, and we had it within five minutes. But just the most exquisite plumage on a red throat. I mean, just partly, I think, because I've, I've never seen one that close, or, you know, except in pictures. So, um, but, so anyway, that guy got... Where did I send him? He actually went to just a nearby, up like Caspian or something, because he just needed bigger water. He was fine. Um, so anyway, anyway, lots of neat little things there, and I'll stick around if you want any, to ask any other questions, and please email me. It's all on the back of those forms. Um, I have a neat program I call the Casual Loon Survey, which would actually be good for folks in this area, because we don't have a lot of lakes in this area. It's if you need a reason to go kayak, 
I can give you a list of lakes, or you can pick off this list, go visit two or three over a weekend, or if you want to, go for 20. Um, I think my record is about 30 some loons on 20 lakes in a day. Wow. Um, and people are like, well, what do you, it's like, I know where to look. You know? Um, you know, it's a, I do a lot of drive-bys. It's like, there's the pair, they're on the nest, fine, check, I'm off. Only a few did I actually have to go paddle around too much. but. You know, it's, it's, they're that consistent, so they're, that's what, another reason I think why people love them. You, they're there, we can share their lives with us, we can share it with them, and we've learned how to coexist, and that's, that's a big, big thing. So, um, thanks Thank for coming out. Thank you.